Our first reading today is going to be read for us by Sarah Lane Ritchie, and it comes from Romans chapter 8, verses 26 to 39. So listen now for the voice of God. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our second reading is from the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 13, verses 31 to 33. And it will be read for us this morning by Vivian Hutchison. So listen now for the voice of God. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds... Yet, when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. Of mercy for 
unjust and unjust a new way to live and God will delight when we are creators of justice and joy yes God will delight when we are creators of justice Justice and joy. For everyone born a place at the table to live without fear and simply to be, to work and speak out, to witness and and joy. Yes, God will delight when we are creators of justice, justice and joy. Good morning, everyone. I'm glad to be back in church today and to assist Martin in the conduct of this service, particularly at such a busy, though happy time for him and Sarah. And I've had the privilege of the few here this morning who've been able to meet in person Rowan for the very first time. It's perhaps fitting that our New Testament lesson should be two of the shortest parables in the teaching of Jesus, these speaking about great growth from small beginnings, the parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the leaven in the dough. These point both to the kingdom of God. This is the central theme of Jesus' teaching. Though we can sometimes forget this, particularly as John's gospel and the letters of Paul uh, pay relatively little attention to the kingdom, Yet we know from the earliest gospel, Mark, that this was quite central to the way that Jesus understood his ministry and his activity as it spread around Galilee and went to Jerusalem. His first words in Mark's gospel are, the kingdom of God is at hand. And later he teaches his disciples and ourselves to pray, thy kingdom come. Matthew, as we've heard in recent weeks, refers to the kingdom as the kingdom of heaven, Other names have been used for it, the rule of God, the reign of God, the commonwealth of God, or as we might say, the common wheel of God. But what is this kingdom of God? Well, we might begin by saying that the kingdom of God is the community of people in which the two great commandments of the Old Testament are fulfilled, commandment to love God above all others and to love one's neighbor as oneself. Where these commands are fulfilled, the will of God is done and the kingdom reigns. Yet in the teaching of Jesus, there's an intensification of some of these themes, a deepening of their meaning. He speaks about the demand of God, and this is great and exacting in so many ways. We're told to love our enemies, to do good to those that hate us. We're told to purify our inner selves, and even to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, surely an impossible command. And yet at the same time, Jesus teaches that the grace of God is abundant, overflowing, and inexhaustible. Those who turn up in the vineyard at the very last hour and hardly do a turn 
are rewarded with a full day's pay. The lost are sought out. The outcasts are invited to God's great banquet. The forgiveness of God is unlimited, unconditional, and never-ending, no matter how many times we err and fall from God's way. R.S. Thomas speaks about the kingdom in one of his poems. Kingdom of God, he says, is where industry is meant for the making right of bones and the minds that have been fractured by life. We have two images of these parables, both in stained glass, and these illustrate to us the meaning that is intended, humble growth emerging from these small beginnings but leading to great things. The first of them is a stained glass image in the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., and there you see the mustard seed being planted. And in the background, the birds of the air fill the trees with its outstretched branches. It's believed that a mustard tree would rise to a height of about 10 feet beside the Sea of Galilee. And in the Old Testament, the tree with its outstretched branches is a symbol of a great political empire with its power and its reach across lands. So this is a strong image for the kingdom of God in its great outreach. And then we have a second image of the leaven in the dough. Here, a woman bakes a loaf of bread. The dough rises as a result of the yeast or the leaven. In both parables, we have astonishing growth from small beginnings. And one of the features of them is that this growth is surprising. It's not something that we do. It's something that is given to us that happens even as we sleep. We pay no attention to it, but suddenly we notice astounding growth. I've spent some time in recent weeks trying to fill the bare patches in our lawn with grass seed. Often nothing happens. The seed seems to die, and that's it and you can always blame it on the pigeons and the foxes. But at other times, the seed sprouts. You go out in the morning, and you're astonished at what has happened. It's natural, but still it takes us by surprise. We've seen all around us in recent weeks the signs of God's kingdom. The early followers of Jesus probably interpreted this parable as a sign of the growth of the church, and you can see why. These little communities spread across Asia Minor soon spread outwards, despite their internal divisions and the persecution that they faced from time to time, became the largest religion in the empire, and lasted far beyond the empire itself. Yet the kingdom of God is about more than the church for two reasons. The will of God is done not only in the church but outside it, and so the kingdom of God can spread in ways far beyond the church. Second, the kingdom of God is the promised reality that will come at the end. It will supersede even the church, for this is God's great gift to us. Yet it has small origins, and its signs are all around us, even though these may be largely hidden. We've seen this during the time of lockdown. People have got out and cleaned the roadsides of litter, parks and rivers. Others have kept our food banks stocked and ensure that these supplies are distributed to the needy. Others have checked up on their neighbors to make sure that they're doing okay and to ask how they might help. All signs of God's kingdom, seldom showing up in the news reports, but genuine nevertheless. And sometimes these small gestures have surprisingly significant outcomes. 
They are trigger events that lead to wider movements. They cause a chain reaction. When Mrs. Rosa Parks got on a bus on the 1st of December 1955 in Montgomery, Alabama, she took her seat. But as the bus filled up, the driver, in accordance with the regulations of the company, asked her to give up her seat for a white person. Mrs. Parks refused. She later said that she was tired of giving in. She was arrested, tried, found guilty, fined $10 plus legal costs. But her small protest was a trigger event. The black churches decided to organize a bus boycott. And after about a year, they succeeded. The bus company ending its regulation of segregation. This was a landmark moment in the civil rights movement. All from Mrs. Parks one evening, decided that, deciding that she was tired of giving in. These small gestures can have dramatic consequences. This week we've been dismayed to learn of the plastic that fills our oceans, the widespread pollution all around the globe. But how will this be arrested? It will require people in thousands of individual locations taking action, cleaning up their beaches and their shorelines, starting to come together to exert pressure on governments and international agencies. An American political philosopher, Jeffrey Stout, has written a book called Blessed Are the Organized. It's a book about the importance of grassroots organizations, of local movements in which people come together and mobilize. These little movements, he says, are vital for the healthy functioning of a political democracy. Without them, democratic governments will cease to be responsive to the needs of their people. And it's in these individual locations at the grassroots level that people acquire leadership skills. They learn how to argue and to advocate. They come together, they organize, they exert pressure. Stout says it's not enough to vote once every four years and send the occasional email to your political representative. More has to be done. In our society, thousands of local civic institutions need to come together to learn how to contribute to the wider common good. Robin Jenkins, a Scottish novelist, in his great story, The Cone Gatherers, says that by being born or even just conceived, one becomes involved. We can't all be political activists, but each of us, I suppose, has a duty towards our common life. There is, of course, one obvious objection to these two parables. The kingdom of God never quite spread in the way that was promised in both the parable of the mustard seed and the leaven in the dough. Jesus himself encountered opposition and defeat in his crucifixion. And many of his other parables introduce different themes, more somber themes of division, of opposition, of conflict, and of delay. So what is it that is promised in these two parables? We might hazard the guess, I think, that these two parables point us towards the resurrection of the dead. It is in the coming of this great kingdom, which we do not create but which is given to us, that these seeds finally reach their destiny. What is buried in the ground suddenly flourishes. What dies is born again to new life. What is crucified with Christ is raised with him. So these parables point towards the kingdom, 
in which the dead are resurrected. They're parables of hope, of grace, and above all, of the coming of God's commonwealth in our midst. Thanks be to God. Amen. Hi, I'm Kristen Willis. I'm session clerk and chairman of the stewardship committee here at the church. Over the past few months, our church's ministry has developed and grown as we have learned to worship and connect virtually as a congregation. As our church's ministry continues, so do our financial responsibilities. Your continued support by fulfilling your annual pledge and making weekly offering contributions helps ensure that our church's ministry can remain strong. You can continue to support us by sending a check to the church's office by clicking on the online giving link on our church's website, fpnv.org, or by clicking the plate link in the weekly emails. We thank you in advance for your generosity and support. Let us go to God in prayer. Holy One, words cannot express how thankful we are that you consider us to be your children, your treasure, your pearl beyond all price. Words cannot express how grateful we are that nothing, angels, demons, death, or life, nothing can separate us from your love. Lord, we pray today for all who are yet to hear this news. May you continue to sustain all who seek to make you known across our world. Be with missionaries, Bible translators, children and family ministers, chaplains, preachers, and pastors. Be in conversations, in Bible studies, in cathedrals and house groups. Be in all that opens people's eyes to you, to your love, and to your call. God of love and compassion, we pray for all who seek to make a difference in the lives of others. Be with carers and counselors, medics and mediators. Be with those with listening ears and those with caring hands. Be in all that opens people's eyes to you, to your love and to your call. 
God of justice and peace, we pray for all who seek to challenge injustices and stand up for what is right. Be with the politician and the protester, the activist and the pacifist, the vocal and the silent. Be in all that opens people's eyes to you, to your love and to your call. Hear us and help us to see you this day and every day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.